Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal, coming to you from sunny West London. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on episode one of Rune Soup, we welcome the excellent and estimable Peter Gray of Scarlet Imprint. Uh, if this is your first time listening, which presumably is its episode one, uh, it is your first time listening, you can find show notes and additional information at runesoup.com. Uh, but let's get started. Peter, how are you? I'm good, Gordon. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we are here today to talk about your latest book, Lucifer Princeps which I'm looking at right now, another marvellous, marvellous uh, piece of work. Thanks. So I guess we'll start, I mean, chapter one is called A History of Error. Uh, what is that error? And is that why we, um, is that why we decided to write the book? I asked myself one of those, one of those foolish questions, um, which was, who is Lucifer? Because it's one of those names that people throw around a lot without necessarily giving a lot of thought to the, the origins and meaning that are behind the name. So I was mindful that there was a lot of inherited wisdom, which is in fact outright nonsense that was being propagated on the internet and has also been propagated by various occult and witchcraft uh, movements due to their inability to actually take a hard look at the evidence and to understand who Lucifer is. So my initial, um, my initial um, thought was that this would be a, a relatively straightforward process, that I'd simply begin the research, I'd discover who the figure was that was standing behind Lucifer, and I'd be able to pull together a fairly comprehensive and straightforward history. Uh, but as I began to examine the material, I found that that certainly wasn't the case at all. And I began to quite rapidly understand why people had shied away from doing the work. Because the story is, the story is extremely complex um, and it contains a lot of overlapping, um, overlapping agendas from different um, from different religious groups and um, and different time periods, so so yeah, I, I basically I opened Pandora's box by deciding to look at this, um, but I feel that it was an important work to do because the the texts that were being cited at the time um, and and still continue to be cited. Um, writing a book that sets things straight doesn't prevent people repeating errors, but the books that were being cited by people were were frankly terrible scholarship masquerading as um, up-to-date work. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to use the word Andrew Collins at this moment. Uh, <laughs> well, this, uh, is, this is what's interesting about, uh, there's not, I mean, there's quite a few, but not every error has a history. And, um, and, and, a, and an error or a misread like this is, is quite a long-lived one, um, which means if you, if you are looking at some of the more recent texts, say the last 50 years, they are built of previous eras as well as perhaps adding uh, some of their own stinkers. Yeah, I think we, we've, both, we've both talked about this before. We're in a, we're in a unique time in terms, of, in terms of magic, in terms of the amount of material that's available to us. Uh, the, the sheer amount of good work that has been done um, in the historical field, in the archaeological field, um, has enabled us to to really get a, a view of history that we didn't have before. In the same way that we saw the way that the Golden Dawn developed out of you know Egyptology and the the, the new archaeological material that was coming then, we're in we're in an information age, um, and it's quite easy to to see Lucifer as a you know as as a patron of that. That new, that new opening, that new light, that new degree of information, which is available to us all as researchers, and we're in a position where we can examine ideas about Luciferianism, about Satanism, without feeling that we're we're under threat by a, a religious or a you know or, or a social establishment. So it's important that the the magic takes the time to understand exactly what this historical moment represents. 
and to understand that we can make huge changes to what we have what we've had as received wisdom, we can change the way that we operate, we can change the way that we understand our histories. And rather than seeing history as something which undermines our ideas, we can actually gain far greater insights by engaging with history than with pretending it isn't there or perhaps creating another category and calling it magical history, which somehow removes from us the, the need to undo, undertake any scholarship. We've really we've really got to face up to the facts that a lot of the things that we thought were true or that have been inherited are utterly wrong. And it's for us as the, the, the new generation of magicians to really engage with that. And that's something, that's something that I see you doing with RuneSoup and that's something that you've done very much with Starships. When Starships comes out, people will be aware of that. We Starships, just to jump in there, my new book coming out next month. <laughs> And, um, and I'm still getting same, used to this so, podcasting thing. I assume I have to like throw ads in every yeah, now and again. Yeah, yeah. you've got to have an ad every 50 <laughs> minutes. If you yeah. get a few pop-ups, that would be great. And also, I mean, I've, I've got to make, mention Jake Stratton Kent because the work that Jake's done on the Grimoire tradition, you know, is, is exemplary. And it shows, it shows the way that magic should be engaging with the past and, and, and building a way into a different future. Well, yeah, obviously, um, you're speaking my language there. I um, I often think just to look at the parallel with the Golden Dawn, as you say, we're in an information age. They're in an electrical age. They had um, telegraphs from London. Uh, I mean, the, the Imperial Telegraph was uh, the greatest on Earth, but it, it, you kind of see a mapping of the worldview um, versus the technology and the, the politics at the time. And we have another one now where... They would perceive direct connections, telegraph metaphoric connections, if you will, to to sort of far flung places. And it's Mm. that combination of um, improved access to culture and technology that allows us to see the world again. And um, in in the 21st century, in this kind of information age or dare I say post digital age, for those of us lucky enough to uh, to be going down that route, um, it does look very different, and I, I view that as quite an empowering thing. What people seem to forget, some of the more exciting sort of moments at the beginning of the Golden Dawn. I mean, um, Mathers first saw Moina in the British Library. She was in there in the uh, Egyptian Hall doing her sort of drawing and, and, and art stuff. So they were right in the middle of what was cutting-edge uh, history and what was cutting-edge art, and they built something that was, you know, admirable for 20 years. How, how, it's, it's questionable how long um, any movement's general life cycle is. And, uh, and it seems like we have that opportunity uh, again now. Yeah. And with, with the Golden Dawn, um, we, which you see a lot of people trash talking on the internet, you have, to, you have to see what they were able to accomplish with a very small group of people um, in, a, in a very limited amount of time you and know, they were they, young too i mean when young, i when, yeah, I, when I talked to geraldine in atlantis so as you can probably tell that was where uh, the skype connection cut out uh, we were just going to talk about the comparative youth of the golden dawn and the implications for that uh, for the kind of things they managed to build in and around london but that is very definitely a podcast for another time so uh without very much more ado we shall return to peter again okay um well, Maiden Voyage of the Titanic, same thing, you know, first podcast, you try to make it about Lucifer, you say nice things about the internet, and then you spend 10 minutes of just complete crash. Anyway, now I'm going to have to learn how to edit before I put this up. <laughs> uh, the internet anyway. plus magic, what could possibly go wrong? Exactly, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of history, we're going to pull that one back, leave the Golden Dawn to um, when we we're just talking about a history of error. We were. If we sort of wind it back, moving further into the book, um, how was rebellion seen in the Near East at the time? And, and how is that sort of different to how we would potentially characterize it in an unthinking contemporary way? That that essentially is is one of the issues that when we when we deal with the past we we immediately start to project project where we are as moderns onto the way that we read these texts. So when we read when we read a term like rebellion, um, 
we immediately get these these marketing images of of you know James Dean style cool kind of um, and all these all these all these great kind of teenager fuck you um, icons. Whereas rebellion in the ancient world was was seen as going against the entire the entire order of the universe. So rebellion was a very a very serious matter because an act of rebellion was upsetting the cosmic order. So when Lucifer is styled as a rebel, he's not being um, he, he's not getting this edgy outsider status. It's saying that the entire the entire cosmos is being turned on its head. So he's so not just he, staying out late. No, he's not just he's not just staying out late and being being caught smoking weed. Um, he's, uh, he's 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 destroying the cosmic order. Um, which is a very, you know, this this is a very serious thing. Um, so when we look at when we look at Isaiah and we look at the the, the attacks on this 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 rebellious character, um, he's doing something he's doing something profound to the cosmic order. Well, this ties into some of the um, at first glance confusing uh, associations of Lucifer with kingship, doesn't it? Because if we're talking about rebellion in the Near East, yeah. um, it is intimately associated with kingship, which was seen as uh, uninterrupted kingship was part of the proper running of the cosmos. So to disrupt that um, is to disrupt the cosmos, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, kingship is... Kingship is probably the the most important, well, one of the most important strands in the book is is an understanding of of how kingship functioned in the ancient Near East, um, and how this idea of kingship, if you don't understand the way that that um, that it works, and also the the conflict over the role of kingship, the entire the entire literature of the period is 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 meaningless to you, um, through to um, some of the most famous aspects of the Bible, such as the you know the visions of um, the visions of Ezekiel of God sitting upon a, a fiery throne. Um, this is um, this is an image of this is an Im- image of kingship. The I- the ideas of the way in which the temple functioned um, required the king sitting as God and pronouncing pronouncing as God um, the the living. The living king was um, was was essentially divinity. This is also one of the vectors that allows people to kind of, I guess, feel their way back to the um, earlier antecedents to Hebrew mythology to try and to try and find it. They want to, I, I guess, returning to um, more recent eras. People expect to look back in history and find a figure of Lucifer in a um, non-Judeo-Christian context that yeah. has been absorbed and and is available for neo-pagans to put on an altar somewhere. And one of the things I, I, I mean, I enjoy all your books, but one of the things I thoroughly enjoyed about this book was that it provided... Um, richer context for people trying to go if not um I, you know it's questionable whether um it's kind of like stepping into a river it's questionable whether there are such things as pre and post when you're talking about a kind of current of mythology yeah. but it seems when it comes to kingship in particular and, and how that was seen and its cosmic implications it's it's it seems like it's a very strong vector um, pulling back to babylon and even uh, sumeria yeah, and it, it also it also produces a much more a much more complex and problematic story than 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 one would expect, because fundamentally I'm a I'm I'm opposed to the idea of monarchy. I'm you know I, I'm large I, you know I I could be described politically as as an anarchist. So plenty of people are looking at Lucifer and thinking that they're going to get uh, a, a nice tidy rebel figure. Um, preferably one that they can pull f- from a pantheon with a set of practices that they can go to. It's quite disquieting to suddenly discover that that not only is there no single figure that you can pull out and say this is the Ur Lucifer, this is the Lucifer that that you know that that Judaism or, or Christianity perverted. Um, 
when that's removed from you, you're, you're placed in a you're placed in a much more challenging position because you have to you have to understand that the world is 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 not as neatly organised as um, I was going to say Llewellyn, but I can't say Llewellyn anymore, can I? Shh, no. Um, I, I well, I'll, say Llewellyn book I'll, book I'll jump in now. Um, uh, <laughs> I think what you, that that kind of X marks the spot, um, Edwardian Victorian folklore history, where you go out looking and and kind of um, pan or Venus spotting across uh, mythologies. Uh, yeah, uh, is um, is one of the persistent errors that I think the sort of new magical renaissance or magical revival is here to disrupt and remove. Yeah. Um, um, it, it is not an X marks the spot um, version going back through history to find a, an original one because you, you you throw out too many layers. This is actually what Heinrich Schliemann did when he discovered Troy. Mm. Looking for the original one, he destroyed thousands of years of layers of history above it, bulldozing looking for the main one, which has really made it difficult <laughs> to kind of study the history of the area now. And we still have largely because of that um, formation at the sort of opening years of the 20th century of Western magic, it, well, as popularly practiced, um, we still have that model and it, um, it's very inefficient. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's also that people very often, um, when they come to magic or they come to, to occultism in various ways, very often they want to, they want to destroy the programming that they have already um, but as a result, they're, they're prone to taking on um, exactly the same thing. You know, like the, the classic example is where, where people replace Jesus with, um, with the goddess. And the goddess that they replace Jesus with is essentially, you know, Jesus in a dress. So the same thing can happen with Lucifer. Lucifer is very often used um, as a, a polite way for people to say Satan. So it's easy to say... Um, there's, there's Satan who is bad, um, and he's not ours. He's nothing to do with us. He's something that the Christians invented. However, there is this other figure called Lucifer who is good and light and looks, you know, striking like Jesus. Um, in fact, when you, when you read some texts, they are literally saying that, that, that Lucifer is Jesus if you, if you read them closely. And that's a nonsense. It's an absolute nonsense. So... The book reintroduces doubt for people because it opens up a whole series of questions about who this figure is, what are their assumptions about rebellion, what's, what, what, are, what are your understandings about the, the nature of the ancient Near East, what's your understanding of kingship, what's your understanding of the process of apotheosis. I think it's much more helpful for people to to understand that, that things are not as straightforward as perhaps they would like them to be. I like and that. And that requires work. Yes. It, well, certainly. I like that um, characterization of the reintroduction of doubt. It's like turning the sort of bending the exclamation mark into a question mark um, because it's, it's quite a compelling, it's a compelling sort of doubt. Um, it has, for me anyway, I mean, I certainly, you, you end up, going, is Lucifer the Roman lightbringer? No. Sometime around the age of 15 and uh, and then move on and, and, and don't really think about it and just, well, I did anyway, categorize it in this kind of um, angel plus metaphor. Very useful. Yeah. Um, uh, and this book, for me, it really provided um, uh, alignment with some of the other things and, and enlightenment with some of the other things that you sort of see hidden in the background of uh, the Western tradition. I do a lot of Four Kings work. So the the, the yeah. book goes into an exploration of kingship. And as you say, you said you're not a monarchist. Um, the kings that are spoken of or erased from memory in, in sort of Near East culture and mythology are not, it's not um, Queen Elizabeth waving from a carriage. It's... Um, they're sort of their tribal leaders uh, and and their health um guaranteed the health of their tribes or their local area these are so, these are a combination of warlord and demigod so mm -hmm. i um if people do go into uh, if people do sort of follow along the lucifer track expecting um 
well, confusing petulance with rebellion and then and then reacting to um, kingship as if there's some sort of orthodox um, play in there. Yeah. I, I would encourage them to continue reading, put it that way, because what you actually find is, what you have to learn is the, the actual language of politics of the time that the mythologies were either formed in or or absorbed on their journey to us yeah. because there was no there was no alternative to kingship you just you either had you had the shit king or you had a you had a good king so the idea that you would be anti king is not necessarily found um at the time and the place uh, yeah. and that's one of the pieces i think people need to look at that for me was very interesting uh because it ties into some of those um some of the apocryphal saints, some of the well, some of the early Christian saints that patently didn't physically exist, but have clearly absorbed um, mm. ghosts and forms of of warlords and warriors along the way, and, and they they recur as this um, directional notion of kingship in, in in some of the grimoires, and and you kind of go into, uh, and for me this was hugely valuable, um, the wider. Um, ancestral and wider spirit context of that and Lucifer and his role amongst as, as primus and pares of dead kings uh, yeah. and for me that was that was a sort of uh, that was a revelation that was something that I could I could definitely work with and yeah. one of the other pieces I think because you sort of describe um, and we'll, we'll, I will, I'll get you to do this now um, the fall as um, a cornerstone myth of the Western tradition. Now it's tied up with this um, revivified understanding of kingship. But would you sort of care to give us an overview on that? Yeah, the fall is a the fall is a, a huge and and uh, again none of these none of these none of these areas have simple answers. Um, so for the fall, the fall in Genesis um, contains. We could say there are two. There are two competing myths of the fall in Genesis. You've got one. You've got one story where there's a race of giants who, whose monuments still stand, um, who are the you know this this is a common myth across the Near East about the race of giants, which we see in in what's what's really a megalithic landscape. Um, and what, what's interesting about the megalithic landscape and the the dolmens that are there is that these are these are just bare stones there isn't there isn't a there isn't a record of the culture but there are there are hundreds if not if not thousands of these sites scattered across israel which were considered to be you know the the homes of dead kings with no real oral cultural oral cultural remembering of who built these massive structures where did these things come from so the idea of the giants is is within Genesis, um, and the the flood exists as a way to explain um, perhaps why perhaps why they they no longer exist. But tied also in with this, there's there's an origin myth about the nature of man and how man came to be embodied with this divine spark. And in addition to that, there's the idea of the descent of these teaching spirits. And when I when I characterise the you know the, the myth of the the myth of the fall as being central to to Western magic um, and to to witchcraft in particular, is the fact that the spirits who the spirits who who fall are spirits who teach. The spirits who teach the skills of civilization, and they they also teach the the secrets of magic. And by virtue of their fall, they're enfleshed or embodied in the physical. They yeah. they, they don't remain in the sky. Yeah. Uh, and so the experience of the forest or the desert uh, is one where the spirits you interact with, you conceived of as having fallen. Yeah. Um, and to to fall, to fall probably means to have fallen in battle. So the idea is that these are the, these mighty men, these men of renown, um, are are warriors. Um, they're they're part of. Um, you, you find it. You find elements of it in um, in the the Ugaritic uh, Baal texts, um, and 
in the remnants of Canaanite religion that these these were the ancestors who who returned once a year to the threshing floors um, on their chariots and um, and this was part of the renewal of the land um, the, the the return of the dead in the same way that perhaps we would see the the wild hunt in Western Europe um, so and- there's there's a there's a huge amount of material that can be drawn out of the biblical record. And another thing that's important is that, that very often people people come to magical, people come to the occult, and the first thing they do is they step away from the Bible, when in fact the Bible is one of the best sources that we have for a lot of material. Um, however hostile it has been to other cultures, it's also it's also cut and pasted its way together. So you find that there are passages in the Bible that are lifted directly from Canaanite religion. You find these, you know, these exhortations, you find things that you can use, um, if only you understand how to, how, to, how to get to them. So when you said that, that in the fall legend, when, when, they, when, they, when they take flesh um, as giants, um, there, are also, there are also other versions where, where they don't take flesh, where, where the, they appear as angels, very often as birds of prey, um, that appear um, to to receive the sacrifice on the on the on the high points of um, on the sacred mountains, and there are even there are even some dialogues um, that I've reproduced um, between between people and and these angels. Um, there, there are actual dialogues that have been recorded in these kind of like shamanic contests as they try to displace displace the old ancestry cult with a new ancestry cult. Um, well, so all this talk of the sort of descending teachers uh, onto mountaintops is getting dangerously close to an A word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so not the double A word, surely. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, but the the A word in in this case, uh, I mean, one of the things again, um, I f- I found this vector uh, of of inquiry very useful uh, in that it matches a, a lot of my own, but. Um, the A word in particular, one of the, I hesitate to use the word survival because mythology doesn't really move that way, but one of the sort of recognizable continuities from, say, uh, pre-Hebrew mythology in the area and, and going much, much further back is this um, teachers descending from the sky, yeah. which is the A word. Uh, how, rather than systematically going through why you probably aren't talking about cape wearing cone heads from space coming <laughs> down and teaching men how to shape crude rocks yeah. how might we conceive of this notion uh, and uh, and and how it is survived into say um, at least early grimoire practice or late classical practice yeah, the, there's essentially no no need to invoke the alien hypothesis um, on the basis that that nothing that nothing that the technology achieves can be achieved by um, by human means. The other important thing to to interject with is that um, the Bible is quite precise about who the angels teach. Um, the angels teach women, um, and I've seen this. I've seen this um, elided um, by various um, proponents of witchcraft um, in, a, in, a, in a way that I think is, is unfortunate because it deliberately says that the angels teach women, um, which also includes, you know, there's obviously a, a, a sexual component to this as well. Um, but we're looking at, we're looking at um, what humans have already, always known that if you go to the mountains, you will find spirits, you will find wild spirits. And what we see with the dead in particular and the way that they're characterised in the literature of the time is as feathered. The the angels are are deliberately, um, deliberately shown as birds of prey. Um, 
the words that are used um, make it difficult to like identify a clear species. I mean, we see anat described as a kite, for example, in the Canaanite um, material, but we're also looking at like griffin vultures would be a, a, a particularly clear thing, you know, a clear example, and also the eagle right the way through the region. So people are having um, people are having shamanic encounters with teaching spirits and the dead, um, who are glossed um, largely as 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 birds, as avian. And again, that's something that we see that comes right through to the grimoire so tradition. So if you look at um, Goetia, for example, there's a huge preponderance of bird spirits within that text. And I think you can place that within the tradition um, of what was happening in, in, in the ancient Near East, um, that, that the spirits that we're encountering and learning from are very often guised as animals. Well, the, the the bird thing makes sense, especially in the area, because again, um, it's the custom we may reasonably uh, surmise um, of, of viewing birds as the spirits, particularly, as you say, birds of prey uh, and birds ex- encountered in the mountains. We may reasonably surmise this is uh, this long predates the uh, the emergence of the stories that became the old testament because it's it's patently shamanic however um problematic that term is you have an animal that actually consumes the dead and takes it away that can operate on land and yeah. in the sky and hence the and even in the, the very same area you do have um effectively neolithic survivals of of bird cults uh, yeah. and and this is this is the piece that i think when people go looking for uh, the X marks the spot version of history. They miss it because what what they're, what they're actually encountering, if they read this material correctly, is how that that story and that that method of spirit access survived. It did survive through uh, biblical stories and into the Western tradition that way. There wasn't a, there, there wasn't a secret parallel road where yeah. this stuff where this stuff happened, and and that's well, is- why people need to sort of. Um, go back to go back to Sunday school um, with wizard eyes. Yeah, well, this is what we see with with the whole idea of the angels, um, who are very often these demoted um, celestial hierarchies who've kind of sneaked in through through the back door. So, what what were once avian teachers and and various forms of gods and the mighty dead? become brought back into Christianity in the forms of in the forms of these angelic figures. And on a practical basis, you, we thus have an explanation for why um, angel magic is so unreliable or just downright weird to the point of, you know, poltergeist and UFO effects, because you're not yep. dealing with um, the good angel on your shoulder. It is, um, it's, it's a memory of a memory of a memory of... Um, of a very old contact story and it's been a bunch of things in between sort of 3500 bc and today uh and and to kind of dismiss 70 percent of that journey looking for the thing that we think it might have been <laughs> yeah and uh is um it's not only a historical but you just you're leaving a lot of value on the table yeah yeah so when when you with the grimoire that that i've included in the book which is the the, the recovered spirit list from Enoch, you see that you see that all of these all, all of these angel figures, they're concerned with they're concerned largely with weather magic. You know, these are very early shamanic forms, um, and they're forms that we can still get in contact with in our own native environments. Well, I mean, what I'm what I'm not suggesting is um, is that we simply we simply look to the ancient Near East and we impose some kind of satanic reading over the top of it, which I've seen done and which is often proposed as as Luciferian when, when in, in fact, it's just a nonsense. Well, it's it's a modern thing. It, um, and it's, again, a historical. Inevitably, people grow out of it. Um, well, the good ones do. Uh, the entire kind of macro sort of, I guess, magical renaissance purpose seems to me to be a restoration of context mm. um which for me at least over the last 10 years has, has definitely provided um i say a lot of value as if it's something i trade off but it's 
it's enriched my life immeasurably to 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 rediscover that that actual context uh, of well, the context, current. context gives meaning um which yeah. is which is why magic has to be located in the landscape it has to be located where you are and one of the things that that's inevitable with the bible is that the stories that you read become transposed onto the landscape in the west so it doesn't it doesn't stay it doesn't stay fixed in one place so in in the in the original lucifer story even though it's not called lucifer and isaiah um, the reference is to to Mount Zaphon as the as the mountain in the north, which which functions as the world axis there, um, and overwrites a lot of the stories about the local Baal who who rule that mountain. But as a practitioner, there's no. I, I'm not suggesting that that one should orientate one's practice around around Mount Zaphon, but rather that we should understand that we have our own sacred mountains, we have our own spirits, we we can. We can take these things and we can find them in our own landscape. And in fact, as Christianity spread across Europe, it did exactly that. It, it renamed everything. So there's there's this kind of um, there's this overwriting which has occurred, um, and that's something that we can engage with in a variety of ways. We can, you know, we, we can we can drill down to whatever level of, of meaning that, that that works for us. Um, but critically, we can engage with spirit in 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 location and in place, um, in in the same way that you know you're constantly doing on your blog, um, with with the way that you're travelling around England, these things make a difference. Well, so that's very nice. The um, I was actually the next point was going to be about the Holy Mountain because I yeah. thought uh, that was quite an illustrative piece, and for me at least, it allows the connection between. Um, the discussions of kingship and specifically dead kings and as you say landscape because uh and also to pulling it back to effectively 20,000 years ago because the the world axis mountain is is a Laurasian or Eurasian idea that is probably about 20,000 years old uh when it um as you say when the stories of Zaphon were absorbed into um the old testament stories they were unaware of that on a on a um, lived basis, uh, and it wasn't Baal. It doesn't need to be Baal now. Once you learn that, you don't need to kind of yeah get out an app and work out which direction Mount Zaphon is from your house and 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 stick a Baal statue there because the the holy mountain is any mountain that you see when you have that context when you, when you yeah. can actually experience it it's why there's i think there's um 120 i was just reading in bill bryson there's 120 something places called devil uh just in england let alone scotland so devil's mountain devil's elbow devil's whatever um and and you get that kind of um layering of a storehouse of stories over a landscape and yeah. uh, and that is how um for me, anyway, that's one of the ways that you you enrich the um, uh, the lived experience of the Western tradition. Yeah, I mean, returning to returning to Andrew Collins, the good thing that he did with the early period of psychic questing is that he he got a generation or or certainly a, a group of occultists out into the landscape, having a magical adventure and engaging with the landscape. And I think that was extremely valuable. And the people who, the people who engaged in this process, um, have been fundamentally changed by it. And I, I think magic needs to be doing that. Magic and um, magic and witchcraft need to be need to be getting out there. Um, they need to be getting out into these places and having these experiences. Yep, absolutely. Um- well, funny you mentioned uh, Andrew Collins because I did want to c- circle back around generally towards the A word, but um, something that honestly I this was I mean it was all new in that respect, but the Rephaim as a concept, uh, if you'd just like to describe that briefly, and then we'll sort of move on to the discussion of it. Yeah, the the, the Rephaim are the are the are the mighty dead of. Um, of the the people of um, the people of Canaan, I'm talking quite a, a general way. I have to be I'm more specific in the book. There are there are some there are there are some problems with with talking generalities about Ugrit and Canaan. Um, 
the people of the people of the biblical the, the, the people of the region um, before um, Yahweh's monotheism pushed out fully were engaged in um, were engaged in ancestor cult. So, like like most people, they were venerating the dead, um, and they had a, a cult around the mighty heroes who preceded them. The example that we most people probably know from the Bible um, would be the the Witch of Endor story, where she engages in an act of necromancy, uh, and she brings um, she brings a, a dead king out of his grave, uh, and that that seems to be the pattern um, of of religious practice in that period, and indeed religious practice everywhere in the world until um, until the dead are, are safely corralled into into graveyards and taken out of people's houses. So, an attack on the idea of these these mighty dead is an attack on the on the very fabric of the culture of the people that that monotheism was overrunning, and also it was a distancing from the the activities that they were engaged in themselves, and an attempt to make them foreign um and so it's it's a leading question but i'm going to do it anyway um what give us the how and why of what we do with that information in a contemporary context now that we now that we we sort of have this what they were and 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 you sort of bringing back to um prominence the um, the reality of these um, these beings and these practices, yeah. um, as as wider um, as wider cultural influences were forming, um, that's that's been skipped. Uh, we there is um, there's some not restoration work. There's recontextualization work for the contemporary magician to do yeah. with that information. How and what does that look like? I mean, this is what what Jake has been banging on about for, for, for a long time, um, which is that the, the dead need to be brought back into Western magic because we've been through a long period where, where, where the dead have been absented, um, both our personal dead and our cultural dead. So how the practice, how the practice looks depends upon, um, depends upon the individual practitioner. So the first part of the process is, of course, working with working with a, a, the familial or ancestral line. So the practice of maintaining an altar for the dead, um, which is what we see in the diaspora religions. And that's one of the reasons why people should be looking at that material, not so that they can um, necessarily practice those forms, but so that they can see a living tradition which is working with the dead. So there's establishing a link with your personal dead, with your line, um, and with the people within your line who are most amenable to engaging in practice with you. So, for example, um, Alkistis has got a, a, very a, a very active Catholic line. So my approach to the dead goes through Alkistis rather than going through going personally through my ancestral dead. Um, and then, and then there's the the work of um, the work of location. So. Where you're living, there is a graveyard. There will be a graveyard, and that graveyard will contain spirits who can be used in addition to your ancestral dead to um, achieve various things and to build relationship with. And again, in the landscape, so where I am at the moment, I'm in the, the borders of England and Wales. So we have a lot of um, we have a lot of mighty dead buried in our landscape. So my work with the dead is constellated from um, the familial personal dead to my local graveyard and the spirits in the local graveyard and to particularly the graves of the dead kings that line all the hilltops around here. Well, see, that that uh, final part was uh, where I was heading. That's a um, sort of fairly significant alignment with how I engage with um, the wider British landscape. And it ties back to what you were saying uh, about the cultures who formulated these stories were in a, a Neolithic and Paleolithic landscape for which they had no context as well. So even um, by the time the Celts got here, um, what was left of Stonehenge, they didn't do it. They had no idea who did it. Uh, and at standing at the very back of a magical experience with the dead are these mighty dead... Uh, semi-divine kings and and 
memories and if not actual spirits that are now you know so old and feral that were actually part of it this 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 idea of the mighty dead allowed people to have at least it does for me and so i'm i'm throwing this back into history and making the assumption uh it allows people to have a a, a living spirit con- uh, uh contact with a stone circle or uh, a barrow or whatever it happens to be without having to kind of go down the Victorian folklorist guesstimate of of what was actually performed there. We actually have about several thousand years of of um, magical, practical context that allows us to do that. People in there, I mean, I had this particular experience yeah. in Cumbria um, where if you experience some of the stone circles there, I had a, a distinct, not vision, but... Um, I don't know, I'll use some sort of chaos magic magic nonsense, like some sort of holographic replay of yeah. people coming up from the town um, for sort of 16th century witchcraft, which was in a distinctly Christian context, and they were going out there um, to meet the devil because the devil put these things there. And so yeah. you, you have this way of... Um, that, uh, And this is what's new, and I, I, I find very vital in your book, but there there is a way of... Um, Bringing that macro story of, say, the Rephaim and, and the Mighty Dead, once they're restored back to to the to the stories that are our culture, like it or not, the Western culture is a Christian culture. That uh, once you restore them back in there, that allows you to kind of turn around and experience uh, the landscape in a in a continuum that I hadn't really done before. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the the work of magic is is very much the work of of reenchantment, and it's it's about putting this generation of people back in touch with the landscape and back in touch with themselves rather than rather than having a, a constant a constant um, a constant streams of of, 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 of what ifs in the same way that that when you're trying to meditate and the voice in your head is saying wouldn't it be better if you had like a pillow to sit on wouldn't it be great if you <laughs> could just like stop and lie something you know by stopping people and saying you are in this landscape. You are surrounded by the dead. Your body carries the memory of your entire ancestral line, and you're dead if you don't have access to their grave sites. You know, you have this. You have this within you, and you can experience it around you. You can you can engage in this as a as a as a lived process. You know, and as a process that you that you walk. You know that that, that you have to go out and walk into. So then, what would what would we uh, what would you like to see happen for that as a for that to normalize in Western magical culture? Like, what do we need to do? Uh, is it you know what are the steps between that being um, what people find first rather than the Wiccan read or what have you? Uh, as uh, for those people out there. I mean, I don't know if this is an explicit podcast. I'll let iTunes decide. But um, for those people out there in their mid-teens who kind of know that there's something to this and, and, and are looking for their way in, and, and most of it is Anunnaki space aliens or the Wiccan read. Yeah, it's a, it's a major problem that, that with the information age, you have to be even more discriminating with with what you read and the the trusted sources that you go for for information so i always i always tell people to read widely if if you've got a if you've got a bookcase which is purely filled with you know these derivative secondhand magical books you would be better off having a copy of the king james version of the bible um, and some solid texts on anthropology and history and learning to extract the technology both from the texts and also from the landscape and the experiences that you have around you. And it's, it's having that, that twin approach. I mean, Lucifer Princeps is a difficult book. It's a difficult book because it doesn't give you easy answers. It doesn't say, stand here, do this. Um, and Are we to expect that. that in the next one? Stand here, do this? Stand here, do this. Yeah. Run a bath. Run a bath. You know, put some lavender in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, the next one. The next one will perhaps be helpful for people in that they will be able to see the way that you can get from from the principles 
um, which are outlined in princeps or, or embodied in princeps into form a formation of praxis, into building your own personal method of practice. Um, so, so, so if, no bars, if you, huh? if you, no, no, no All bars. Right. And if you keep calling me up for blogs, I'm never going to get the damn thing written. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I might read it then. I was expecting it to be baths, but you yeah, know, yeah. it's fine. Well, I'll put one in there for you, Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> I have an appendix. Yeah. Um, I forget where we were. I, now I'm really distracted by that idea. Um, speaking of the future. Oh, that's what we were talking about. There we go. What do we What do we need to see happen? Do we need to see anything happen? I mean, is um, has the magical renaissance effectively peaked? Uh, where What yeah. is What does the world look like in the next eighteen months for, um, from where you sit in the Welsh borders? Sitting in the Welsh borders, I think the magical renaissance has has peaked. Um, there's always a period where. Um, that there are constant there are constant cycles where more people come to magic and then people fall away because magic is something which is only ever going to be performed by a very small group of people. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's elitist. It's just simply that that most people in a modern culture do not have a need to practice magic. They haven't identified a need because all of their needs are met. So the kind of people who end up practicing magic are are a pretty select and small group. And there are interested people who who will buy books, who will read, who will have discussions and will listen to podcasts and will eventually drift away from things. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's simply the way that the the way that the process goes. But the change with technology means that people now have have a huge opportunity to get access to good information without having to go through Victorian magical orders without having to um, send their money away to PO boxes, without having to deal with a variety of dodgy gurus who are generally interested in, in, in you know, the big three of uh, power, money, sex. There, there, are, there, are, there are good ways that you can do work by yourself or with a small group of friends using solid material, the kind of material that's not been available to our forebears. And that's what's going to create the next wave of magic. It's the work which is being do, done by by individuals now. So when you say, um, I just, I'm, I'm quite struck by this because it's, it's potentially a way of understanding um, the, if not magical renaissance, then the uh, appearance of um, magic or the trappings of magic in the wider monoculture. Yeah. If needs, so, and you're right, on a historical basis, um, humans in the developed world have never had their needs more oversatisfied, um, even at a lower socioeconomic status. Um, so does that mean that the sort of, the appearance of the trappings of magic as a... Uh, does that make them an affectation uh, as they appear in in monoculture? Because people do have all they need satisfied, but they're like, "Oh, I don't have that though. I should I should um, consume that piece." That that struck me as being quite interesting. And double banger question. Um, I'm kind of okay with that because um, it it sort of spreads the seeds far and wide and does actually enable. Um, the people to kind of Goldilocks their way uh, back who otherwise perhaps wouldn't have had the context for it. Comments, questions? Well, I think the monoculture is is always going to devour everything. And that, that's what it does. Capitalism just continually takes in and commodifies things. So, so yeah, what, what we do, what we do is, is, is exciting to people. So it will end up in the monoculture what I what I think we also have to do as magicians is make sure that we also tell our story, that we're not just in a position where we sit around applauding when um, when popular culture um, demonstrates, you know, a new series of Salem or whatever. We should actually be building culture ourselves, and I think the culture building aspect of magic has somewhat fallen out from um, from the heyday of all culture um, and the kind of you know the the punk have a go ethos that we saw in like the temple of psychic youth. Um, and back in the early days of chaos magic, I think it's very important that, that we engage and create culture as well as being passive recipients um, for it. Um, 
and also I think magicians should also learn to shut the fuck up. Um, we, we should value our privacy too. Uh, when I'm producing material, one of the reasons that, that you don't find a stand here, say this, do that book from me is that I have profound um, magical misgivings about putting a lot of this kind of information out in the public domain. I think it's bad magic. Um, and I think it's potentially dangerous to you as a, as, a, as a serious practitioner to let everybody know exactly what you do, when you do it, and how you do it. And here's a picture I've uploaded to Instagram. Um, I could not agree more with that, that last piece. Uh, I, find it, um, I find it odd that there is, one, the expectation of replicability as if it were a recipe anyway. I, I, I'm not sure how... Um, that would work given that each particular enchantment is, is unique to the person and the space that it's performed in. So I, 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 I kind of get, I suppose, why we've developed a monocultural expectation for it. But to your point that it's bad magic and potentially dangerous, um, that's actually been my experience. Um, there are a few kind of spirits or classes of spirits I work with that are okay with it. And other yeah. ones are like, in no uncertain terms, some of them ask for it. Some of them are like, Okay, but you have to tell people about this. Yeah, uh, and the rest of them are like, I wouldn't do that. I would like, and I find that very interesting. The, um, the digital performative aspect, I think, is unconsidered. And interestingly, I think it's a phase people go through. So if you 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 could kind of see people. And this is kind of perhaps one of the signifiers that the magical renaissance has has peaked and is going into. Uh, a concealed phase after an overt phase is that you know, there there appears to be, I mean, I don't spend any time on Tumblr, but there appears to be less and less of that um, from people who were maybe doing more of it. It it, it almost feels like magic is recloaking, or authentic magic is recloaking in a way that, um, I don't know, maybe too much sunlight. We, we, we don't tend to like it. Yeah, yeah. I think we, magicians, magicians tend to... Uh, tend towards secrecy. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a ne necessary thing. Um, so although, although, I have a, although I have a public profile through, through Scholar Imprint, um, I have no personal information um, on the internet um, about myself. I have no photographs of my ritual tools. Um, the only thing I do is... is, is is recirculate images of Babylon because that's a that's something that she's very happy um, to have out there. Um, but other than that, I try to keep myself as as, as private as possible. Um, I think it's much more magically potent to to function in that way. And I think that's where um, that's been the journey from. I, I guess looking at a few dozen people who are maybe doing this more publicly over the last few years that is that's gotten less and less part of that has been a change in in how people experience the digital switching from well so the last few bits of the kind of diy um internet have died because of the stream but then yeah. the other part of it is um you do it, surprisingly on a historical basis the idea that you could get a um central american or fijian witch doctor to tell you his or her secrets like oh so how do you do this how do you yeah. um how do you remove the ringworm from that cattle go fuck yourself is how are you yeah. serious <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah let me give you my professional secrets yeah what a great idea and i i find that um i'm not sure if that uh, awareness can be arrived at in anything but a practical way which I think is it's, it's also very difficult for for kids who've grown up just with the internet and with no sense of privacy as a result. So, so I'm not ragging on people who do this because they all have their individual reasons and very often they're still, they're still in a learning curve about it. No, exactly. And it's a way to wake them up. I mean, what will happen yeah. is they'll do it and, and uh, this is what I mean. I think, there's, I think there's a form to it as, as, as a baby witch or baby wizard gets more and more confident Um there is the realization that some of the uh, some of the practices and customs uh, make sense, and you only arrive at that 
realization on a performative basis because you, you i mean it's it's very beginning magician thing to think oh well let's you know get this information out there secrecy is silly um yeah. and and in many respects it is like um, false secrecy is silly like the idea that um the practice of sorcery is some kind of wisdom tradition protected for initiates is not only a historical it's just dumb um and and I and so you can kind of see the the initial re- rejection of secrecy as as a positive part of the journey. And I think as people move further and further along, they do start to realize that, that secrecy forms on an individualized basis rather than around a corpus of material, and and that's when you know you're really cooking with gas. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, speaking of the uh, the the circulation of Babylon images, um, it struck me because of. The of the books you've written, uh, the Red Goddess is the one I've read the most. I mean, it is the one that's the oldest, so those yeah. two things may correlate. Um, but in a funny way, uh, apocalyptic witchcraft. So, if you look at the middle books, I think the Red Goddess and Lucifer match in in a way that, say, Lucifer and apocalyptic apocalyptic witchcraft don't, because in both cases there is a very confident and and nuanced um kicking up of uh western cultural ancient historical mud to provide that that opportunity to re-engage with our stories again because the other one i mean even just the sound of it you kind of have babylon and lucifer and it's all these half remembered uh, desert stories that have actually formed us and and our kind of journey and our world more than I think people initially realize going into the material. And I'm just wondering if that is a is a worthwhile sort of read. Well, I never, I never want to write the same book twice. Um, True. Well, one of the thing I, one thing that very often happens is that you know that this this overworked trope that everyone has a book in them well well very often they don't and very often they just keep rewriting the same book that they don't really have in them um every time that i come to a project i come to the project with a with a blank sheet of paper um so stylistically the books change um according to their needs as well i mean the red goddess was written in a in a deliberately, I mean, it's been called Gonzo um, almost approach. It's designed to to rattle people and to push people's buttons um, because that's what she wants. Um, and and you'll see that if if you if you go to Amazon and see the the various haters who have uh, who have freaked out and when they've seen never that, read the comments. No, I, I, I tend not to. Um, but but the regular ones are always funny because um, because people just. Just grab the wrong end of it and 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 uh, and get themselves into all kinds of trouble, as you'd expect. And you know, apocalyptic witchcraft is a different book to Lucifer. Lucifer is a Lucifer Princess is a is a particularly academic book. It's heavily footnoted. I've I've made I've made clear where all my references are, rather than with a polemic text like apocalyptic witchcraft that that didn't require that kind of academic approach. I don't think that we should all be um, trapped in an academic style and praxis will be different again sure praxis will emerge and be a another entirely different book um and anything that well all the things that i have planned to write after that again they will be they will be different projects they'll have different voices they'll do different things to different people i think where you said that you approach a book from a a blank page uh, and so the the book and the style matches what needs to be said Um, I think why I see not in a content perspective and certainly not in a style perspective where the similarities for Lucifer Mm -hmm. and the Red Goddess are for me is that they're both, if you approach it as a reader in that way, the books are almost traps, they're almost Chinese finger traps because they are designed to if you if you go into it without a preconception of either Babylon or Lucifer, depending on which one, you um, you come away uh, enriched and rattled is is a good word for it. Like you come away going, "Wow, I did not." Um, I now have uh, far greater context for things that I thought I had context with before, and I suspect that. Whereas with apocalyptic witchcraft, um, it, it it was sort of a, a much needed polemic or yeah. kind of adrenaline adrenaline rather um, stabbed into 
um, contemporary witchcraft's heart to to kind of wake it up. And you knew that going in, and it's a wild ride. But um, the red God- the red goddess and Lucifer for me were. Um, a more interesting, not more interesting, uh, a, a trickier reading experience because yeah. uh, you yeah. you come away going, wow, that was, um, yeah, um, I didn't know the destination going in, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, they, they demolish more certainties. Yeah, which I suspect is why um, the comments are more varied because in both cases, in particular in Lucifer's case, um, people, I may surmise, were expecting to have their view validated in your book rather than their view expanded by your book yeah i mean i've had a i've had a very good reaction to it i mean there have been a few people who've been who've been who've who found it difficult because they expect they expect the lucifer figure to be standing there for them and when i patiently show them what these things are they come to the end of it and they're like but where's the Lucifer that, that, that I paid the ticket price for? Where's, <laughs> where's my Lucifer? Funnily enough, uh, he's right fucking there. Yeah. Give it a yeah. shot. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, that's difficult for people. Um, Praxis will Praxis will bridge that a bit more because um, a lot of the material that I'm that I'm building on for it, particularly the ritual material, comes from comes from much later sources. Um, because that's when we start to actually engage with Lucifer as a culture, um, largely while Christianity is in the process of disintegrating through the late grimoires um, and through through the Romantic period, um, when people are when people are in a position where they can actually begin to to work with Lucifer in an open way, um, because a lot of the material prior to that, um, you find groups that that have been called Luciferian, and when you look closely, you find that that they're no such thing; that it's simply it's it's simply church propaganda to um to anathemize um to anathemize differing religious perspectives rather than any kind of organized um form of uh, of opposition well see that that makes sense to me and if if any if the um the magical renaissance or whatever has a any recognizable form uh i think it is that I think it is a way of engaging uh, or, or discovering or encountering authenticity by finding the um, the most recent or the uh, the oldest, which sometimes turns out to be not that old way of engaging with the material in a way that um, provides the context of, of what's going on. So in that respect, you have only yourself to blame for splitting Lucifer away from the devil, because if you went down the devil route, there would have been plenty of stuff in Western Europe that's earlier. Um, mm. But the devil is not Lucifer, which is one of the things you learn reading the book. And also <laughs> is, but yeah, yeah. let's... So as you can probably tell, that was the second Skype malfunction in a one-hour conversation. Um, the good news is, I guess, this this is technically the first podcast slash simultaneous audio commentary at the one time. Uh, and in, you know, in the spirit of that, let me tell you two things since we last spoke. I fucking hate GarageBand, and I've had two-thirds of a bottle of wine. Uh, back to Mr. Gray. All right, second dropout, um, you know, two in 90 minutes. Hopefully it gets better. Uh, and funnily enough, we were coming up towards the end anyway. So, Mr. Gray, as ever, lovely talking to you. Always fascinating. Um, so for people who uh, would like to know more, where would they find you on these, their internets? Um, we're on the internet at scarletimprint.com. Um, we have uh, Twitter at Scarlet Imprint. Um, we have a, a Facebook page um, as Scarlet Imprint as well. Um, yeah, basically we're Scarlet Imprint on on every every social media thing that we can. Um, so we 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 post updates there, but um, but I'm pretty private, so it is is just it's just work related. So people aren't going to see what you had for breakfast. Unfortunately, not. No, no, no bath recipes. No breakfasts. No. Uh, right. No well, this is over. This, this this podcast is over. Sorry, I was. It I, is. The whole thing was building up to that. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Once again, uh, thanks very much. Now I will um, turn off the record button and work out how to do an outro. So.
So there you have it, episode one in the can. Uh, be sure to subscribe via YouTube, iTunes, or your preferred app. And if the show isn't showing up in your app of choice, uh, just drop me a note at podcast at runesoup.com, and I shall endeavor to correct that. Uh, also, this is going to be a weekly show, uh, and I have some pretty good guests lined up already. Uh, but if you have some suggestions, do drop me a note at that same email address. That's podcast at runesoup.com. Now, I don't just do this or, frankly, anything else for my health. Uh, I have inevitably an ulterior motive, uh, and that is I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of the topics covered in today's show, uh, specifically around the role of kingship and or the fall and or the dead in Western magic. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments on the blog post or in the RuneSoup Facebook page, which is obviously Facebook slash RuneSoup. Uh, or drop myself and Peter a note on Twitter and we can get one of those old-timey conversations going, if you remember them. Uh, I'm Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore White, W-H-I-T-E. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And that's it. Until next time. <laughs>